So here we are, back on the project, although it's a slow start, <laughs> as we're not in the groove, and I have to load up all the, all the tools, bring them back here, and uh, like I said, we're not in the groove. And you get here and you look at all the work that's got to be done and it's kind of overwhelming. But once we get rolling, get a few things done, it'll be good. And we'll get back in the groove again, we'll be making progress. It's been a long winter though. Got lazy and fat. So for starters, here, what I'm going to do over here, when we put all those sealing joists in there and decked it off and covered it the top draped down and that kept that whole floor system dry throughout this whole project so I'm going to cut off this part of the tarp and then box in the soffit here and that's going to be the first plan of attack and then just get rid of this but all the tarp upstairs that we're going to cut free won't go to waste because after we bring the grade up inside the garage, get all that gravel compacted at the grade I want, I'm going to lay that tarp down on top of it before we put in those rubber stall mats. And it's going to be the perfect size because the same size up there as it is down here. So we sacrificed the tarp but really didn't waste anything. Yeah, man. Everything's going according to plan. You know, we were so fortunate to have the weather that we had, and we got this thing banged up. Just two of us got it dried in, and then winter set in. And nothing was ruined. It's just so blessed, you know. Here I'm boxing in the eave with a flat soffit. If a roof has a shallow pitch, I will often skip this step and apply the sheathing and vent strip to the underside of the rafter tails. Flat or at an angle, it'll serve the same purpose. This is a very important part of the structure. If done inadequately, rodents and condensation will ruin your insulation. All right, we got the soffit flattened out. Got the soffit vent in place. I really didn't need that brown metal drip cap right there under the eave but I put it there just to carry the same look all the way around. Now I'm going to rip and stain those boards that are going to go on each side of that soffit vent. It'll be much easier to do them on the ground than do it up there. So we are back to work on the project as you can see and it feels so good to be making progress again. It's been a long winter. Most of you know that we live off the grid, up on the mountain here and our only access in and out for the entire winter is snowmobile or ATV. But spring-like weather is upon us and we are back to it. So I decided I'm going to tackle my least favorite parts of the project first. I never liked working on the eaves, underneath that overhang. I never liked that nitpicky crap. So I'm going to tackle this first and get it out of the way. Now through the winter, I have had a lot of questions come in. People are asking me, well for one, why did I have the rafter tails hang way off the roof on one side and why were they cut flush with the wall on the other side? You've heard me talk many times about how important it is to vent the roof properly. Some people want me to elaborate a little bit more on that. A lot of newcomers to the channel, a lot of people building now. So I want to address some of these questions and explain why I do things the way that I do them. 
Another thing, when I was putting in the piers, people were like, why are you digging the hole so deep? Well, I've built a lot of places over the years. I've been living in cabins in the woods since I was 21. Lots of different cabins and lots of different woods. I've made a lot of mistakes along the way and I've learned what to do and what not to do for the environment that I live in. And that's up here in the woods in the cold. All right, and frost plays, well, it wreaks a lot of havoc on projects if they weren't done properly. Okay, up in New York, up there by the Canada border, that property was all sand. And you could just put a building sitting on cement blocks and it wouldn't move because the sand doesn't heave much like the soil here when there's stones in the soil. So I want to touch base on a few of these most frequently asked questions. And we're going to get through this part of the project. And then we're going to start framing in that lower enclosure. And of course, I will film the project as it unfolds and share it with you all. And if you have questions, leave them in the comments section. And I will answer them further down the line. All right, so let's get back to work. When we were putting in the piers, you saw where I was excavating a larger hole than the piers, and I set the tube in the ground, and then I backfilled it with crushed gravel. And in that video, I said that I want to remove all the stones away from the piers. I'm doing this because we live in the North Country, and we have a lot of issues with frost. If I was digging these piers and the ground was all sand, I wouldn't worry about it. Or if I lived down south where frost wasn't an issue, I wouldn't take the precautions that I do up here. But here it is, springtime is upon us, the ground is thawing out, and here under the carport where I didn't excavate, I only excavated where we were putting the piers. I have a big sinkhole here. And this is a real good example of why I take the precautions that I do. All right, so here I have this big hole in the ground, and about six inches down is a big boulder. It's pretty good size. That looks like that boulder has sunk, but really what happened was the frost heaved it up, up to the surface of the ground here. Now that the ground's starting back out, it's sinking back where it started from. That's a lot of movement for a stone. So if I have stones touching my piers, and this is what's happening to them because of the frost, they're going to upset my piers. But if I remove all of those stones, get them away from where I'm putting the tube, then I backfill the tube with either sand or gravel, I won't have this issue. You go through all the work of putting in a tube, you want it to stay there. And if you have nuggets like this near them, you're going to have an unstable pier. And I don't want that. When we were framing up the structure, you saw where we left rafter tails hanging off on one side but then on this side they were cut flush with the wall and some of my subscribers had asked me about that and I said that when we move on to phase two I'll show you why I did that and you'll be able to grasp it a little bit better than me just trying to type it out so we got spring like weather and we are back on the project and we're moving on to this part of it, so I'm going to show you what I'm doing. When I designed this building, I was planning on having this lean-to coming off on this side. So, I don't want to have rafter tails poking down into this enclosure. They're just going to rob me of good space where I could hang a ladder or whatever on the wall here. So, these were cut flush with the outside of the, this part of the building. So now what I'm going to do, I want to enclose all of this. I'm going to put a, a ledger, a cleat here, some short studs, 
here. I need to let this part vent because this is going to be insulated roof, but I need to allow air to come through here and, all, and run all the way up above the rafter vent to the ridge vent. Otherwise, this section of the roof won't breathe properly. So, to achieve that, I'm going to want to have a soffit vent, just like I have underneath the soffit on the other side. This side is just going to be right here for this length and the same length on the other end of the building. So I'm going to rip some the soft vents, vents around two and a quarter inches. I'm going to leave a little gap for that. I'm going to put a piece of wood here that I can nail my T111 to. And then the soft bit vent will be there and it will allow all of that air to go all the way up and vent out of the ridge vent. All right, I'm going to get to it. For this section here was just like that section that I just showed you. I've got my ledger up there. I've got my studs, everything running in line with the rafters above and the stud work below. And I've got those little pieces of wood there, leaving me just enough airspace for the vent strip to cover. I'm going to T111 all of that. This is the inside here showing the vent strip. Okay. The next plan of attack is I'm going to take some rafter vent. I'm going to run it all the way down to the vent strip that I put in. I'm going to staple it to the roof sheathing. This is going to work its way all the way up to the ridge. I'll have it this entire length. Then I put in my insulation and the rafter vent keeps the insulation from touching the roof plywood and allows heat loss to pass through which will prevent condensation. If you take your insulation and insulate the roof like this, you're going to have a cold, a cold place meeting a warm place. It will cause condensation which will drip all the way down. It will gather on top, on your top plate of your wall it'll eventually work its way into your wall and get trapped there and cause you all kinds of problems. So this simple step by adding this will eliminate that issue. I have shown this many times in the videos in the past when I am at this phase of construction. I do so because it is very, very important to vent your roof. Not everyone watching this video has seen those videos and instead of sending you clickety clicking all over the place to show you this detail I'm just showing it to you again to simplify the process. So here on the dormer roof I'm going to do the same principle I'm going to put up my rafter vent but I want to make sure that it protrudes at least to the outside face of the wall then I will insulate to the outside face of the wall. I don't want to have the insulation stopping here or protruding too far past the wall. This is going to run all the way up just like it is there. And on this wall down here, you saw at the beginning of the video, I put a flat soffit. I put the vent strip there. I'm going to finish it with boards so no rodents can get in. And then repeat the process, that will pass the face of the wall, and the insulation will go in. What I will probably do to this roof, instead of using paper-faced insulation, I will have my rafter vent, unfaced insulation, I may use the Roxel, Rockwool stuff, then I'm going to put bubble foil across here. Then I'm going to strap it to 16 inches on center. Then I will drywall. The three quarter inch trapped airspace between the drywall and the bubble foil will become an insulator in itself. 
This bubble foil will reflect the heat back into the building and I should have a fairly decent R value with that. And if I don't use the bubble foil, then I will just use the paper-faced insulation like I showed over there. I went to buy some bubble foil at Home Depot the other day, and that's where I've always bought it. And they don't have this Reflectix brand anymore. They have some off-brand, ever-built or whatever, and it's about half the thickness of this stuff. I will put the link to what I buy and what I recommend in the description below. The other stuff being half as thick, you're probably going to get half the performance out of it. And it's running the same price as this. I wanted to mention that because I've always talked about the bubble foil. I have great results with it. If I didn't, I wouldn't use it. I certainly wouldn't recommend it. But that other stuff, I picked it up and I'm not buying it. Literally. Okay? So check this stuff out in the description below and you won't be steered in the wrong direction using this. All right. As soon as we got the floor system for the second story in place, we covered it with a tarp and nailed a 2x4 plate around the perimeter on three sides. By doing only three sides, it prevented rain from pooling up and gave us an outlet to sweep out the snow and ice. This was a small investment to protect a larger one. Now that the structure is dried in, we'll cut the tarp away and reuse it as a vapor barrier between the top of the gravel and the finished floor of the garage. And it's already cut to size. This is a win-win situation, and you know how I feel about those. Brighten the place oh, up. This worked out so good. Now we were building in the winter. We got this decked over and then we got snow and freezing rain and a bunch of crap but we had it covered and as you can see we suffered no damages. It's freaking awesome. This project really came out good. Really happy with the way it came out. So we're going to head home and I'm going to get busy editing this footage and hopefully have something out to you tonight. Now some of the plans we have for the structure may change because lumber prices are going up and going up further than they were before. We were at Home Depot about a week ago 2x4s were $7.50 each, and we were there just the other day, and they were around $8.25 or $8.50 or something like that. And I refused to pay those prices. So we will see how it goes. Like I say all the time, if you can't do what you want, do what you can. And that's what we will do, and continue to film it and share it with you all. So that's it for now, folks. All the best to you, and God bless. Frank and the boss out walking in the woods, living life happy and free. Tracks in the snow everywhere they go, there's a pokey way up in that tree. A beaver built a pond where they have some fun, taking life a day at a time. Best friends until the end. Frankie and the boss. Frankie and the boss. Frankie and the Boss